Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be diving into the world of medications used to manage joint disorders. This is a crucial area for healthcare professionals as joint pain and inflammation significantly impact patients' quality of life. We'll explore various drug classes, their mechanisms of action, and important considerations for patient care. Our focus will be on providing you with a practical understanding of these medications, enabling you to make informed decisions in your clinical practice. We'll cover common conditions like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout, and the specific drugs used to treat them. Imagine a 62-year-old woman named Darlene. She's a retired teacher who loves gardening, but lately even walking upstairs makes her knees scream in pain. She's not alone. Joint disorders like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout affect millions and can drastically impact quality of life. The good news? With the right meds, many patients regain their eyes. Let's begin by differentiating between the major types of arthritis. While they all cause joint pain, the underlying mechanisms and therefore the treatment approaches differ significantly. We'll look at osteoarthritis, the most common type, characterized by cartilage breakdown. Then we'll examine rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disease causing inflammation of the joint lining. Finally, we'll discuss gout, caused by uric acid crystal deposition. Understanding these distinctions is paramount because the medications we choose will target the specific pathological processes involved in each type of arthritis. Think of osteoarthritis as wear and tear arthritis. The cartilage in joints gradually erodes like brake pads in an old car. Then there's rheumatoid arthritis, which is autoimmune. The body starts attacking its own joint lining, causing inflammation, pain, and eventual joint destruction. Now let's focus on osteoarthritis. The primary goal of pharmacotherapy here is to manage pain and inflammation, improving the patient's ability to function. We often start with simple analgesics like acetaminophen. For more significant pain, NSAIDs can be effective, but we must be mindful of their potential gastrointestinal and cardiovascular side effects. Topical treatments like capsaicin cream can provide localized pain relief. In some cases, intraarticular corticosteroid injections can offer temporary relief. Tramadol and, in rare instances, opioids may be considered for severe pain, but always with careful consideration of the risks and benefits. We often start with acetaminophen. It's easy on the stomach. But if that doesn't cut it, we move to NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen. Topicals like capsaicin or salicylate creams offer local relief. And for more stubborn cases, intraarticular steroids or hyaluronic acid injections can be game changers. Rheumatoid arthritis treatment follows a stepwise approach, aiming to control inflammation and prevent joint damage. We typically start with anti-inflammatory agents like NSAIDs and corticosteroids to provide symptomatic relief. However, these don't address the underlying disease process. The next step involves non-biologic DMARDs, such as methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, or sulfasalazine. These medications help to slow down the progression of the disease. If these are insufficient, we may consider biologic DMARDs, like TNF antagonists, such as adalimumab, etanercept, sertolizumab, and infliximab. These target specific components of the immune system, but the real workhorses are the DMARDs, drugs that slow disease progression. First up, non-biologic DMARDs like methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfasalazine. If these don't work, we call in biologic DMARDs like adalimumab or infliximab which specifically target inflammatory molecules like TNF. 
This slide provides a detailed overview of selected DMARDs, both biologic and non-biologic. It's crucial to be familiar with the routes of administration, typical adult doses, and potential adverse effects of each drug. For example, methotrexate, a commonly used non-biologic DMARD, can cause liver toxicity and bone marrow suppression, requiring careful monitoring. Biologic DMARDs, like etanercept, can increase the risk of infection. Understanding these nuances is essential for safe and effective prescribing and patient education. Remember to always consult the most up-to-date prescribing information for complete details. For example, methotrexate is a weekly oral or injectable med that suppresses immune function, but it can also cause liver damage and reduce bone marrow output. Tip, always monitor CBC, LFTs, and renal function. Supplementing with folic acid can help reduce side effects. Biologics like etanercept or adalimumab are injected every one to two weeks. Let's take a closer look at adalimumab, a TNF antagonist used in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and inflammatory bowel disease. It works by neutralizing TNF, a key inflammatory cytokine. It's administered subcutaneously every other week. Patients need to be educated on proper injection technique and storage. Common side effects include injection site reactions, upper respiratory infections, and headaches. Importantly, adalimumab carries a black box warning for increased risk of serious infections and malignancies. We need to carefully screen patients for latent infections like tuberculosis before initiating therapy and advise them to avoid live vaccines. This TNF blocker is used for RA, Crohn's disease, and psoriasis. It's given subcutaneously every other week. Teach patients to let the syringe come to room temp before injecting and to rotate sites. Watch for redness or itching at the injection site, increased risk of TB or fungal infections, rare risk of lymphoma. Now, Let's shift our focus to gout. The goals of treatment are twofold, to terminate acute attacks and to prevent future flares. During an acute attack, NSAIDs like indomethacin and naproxen are often the first line treatment for pain and inflammation. Corticosteroids, particularly intraarticular injections, may be used for more severe pain. Colchicine can also be effective especially if started early in the attack. For prophylaxis, we use medications that either increase uric acid excretion, like pro or inhibit uric acid formation, like allopurinol. An acute attack needs fast action. NSAIDs like indomethacin or naproxen are first line. Colchicine is great too, but causes diarrhea if dosed too high. Corticosteroids help in severe or monoarticular attacks. Then we shift to prevention. Allopurinol blocks uric acid production. Probenicid increases uric acid excretion. Fibaxostat is another option when allopurinol isn't tolerated. Allopurinol is a cornerstone of gout management, working by inhibiting the enzyme xanthine oxidase, which reduces uric acid production. It's crucial to start allopurinol at a low dose and gradually titrate it up to avoid triggering an acute gout flare. Patients should be educated about potential adverse effects, including rash, fever, and gastrointestinal upset. In rare cases, allopurinol can cause severe hypersensitivity reactions like Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It's important to be aware of potential drug interactions, such as with warfarin, and to monitor liver and kidney function. Start low and go slow. If you jump to a high dose too soon, you could trigger a flare. Monitor for rash can be benign or deadly. Liver and kidney function drug interactions, especially with warfarin. This slide highlights the importance of recognizing Stevens-Johnson syndrome, SJS, and toxic epidermal necrolysis, 10, 
rare but life-threatening reactions that can be associated with medications like allopurinol. These conditions manifest as a rapidly spreading rash, blistering, and peeling of the skin and mucous membranes. Early recognition and prompt discontinuation of the offending drug are crucial. Patients should be educated to report any new or worsening rash, especially if accompanied by fever or flu-like symptoms. Watch for flu-like symptoms followed by painful skin rash, blistering, and peeling. If you suspect it, stop the drug immediately and send the patient to the ED. Nurses play a vital role in the management of patients with joint disorders. This includes obtaining a thorough patient history, including current medications and allergies, and assessing vital signs. A comprehensive physical examination is essential to evaluate joint pain, swelling, and range of motion. Monitoring relevant lab studies, such as CBC, liver, and renal function tests, uric acid levels, and urinalysis is crucial for assessing drug efficacy and detecting potential adverse effects. We assess pain, swelling, range of motion, and ADLs. We monitor labs CBC for methotrexate liver enzymes uric acid for gout creatinine for allopurinol use. And we document patient education, adherence, and any adverse reactions. Continuing with the nurse's role, patient education is paramount, especially regarding lifestyle modifications. For patients with gout, dietary recommendations are crucial. They should avoid foods high in purines, such as red meat, seafood, and organ meats, as well as alcohol, particularly beer. Encouraging adequate fluid intake, especially water, helps to flush out uric acid. Patients should also be advised to report any flu-like symptoms or rashes promptly, as these could indicate a drug reaction. Limit red meat, organ meats, shellfish, and alcohol, especially beer. Drink plenty of water. It helps flush uric acid. Avoid sugary drinks and maintain a healthy weight. Let's test your understanding with a practice question. Consider a patient with rheumatoid arthritis being treated with adalimumab. Which of the following statements related to this therapy are correct? This question highlights the importance of understanding the potential side effects and considerations associated with adalimumab, such as lowered immune response, risk of reactivation of latent TB, and injection site reactions. Remember to carefully weigh the risks and benefits of each medication and to individualize treatment plans based on the patient's specific needs and circumstances. May lower immune response can reactivate latent TB causes injection site irritation daily dosing? No, it's biweekly associated with osteoporosis, 